have uh, Mark Kitto talking about his experiences in building a uh, media business in China. With that, let me introduce our guest for today. Uh, Dean Nasser, some, many of you probably uh, already know, having seen him on television, having read his uh, columns on uh, Bloomberg View. Uh, he is one of the best known experts on the Mideast, on the Arab Spring, and also on sort of what are the strategic implications for the United States of having a weakened economy, but continued large foreign obligations. He's also very interested in sort of what are the trade-offs between our region, China, greater China, and the strategic pivot versus the Arab Spring and some of the US commitments there. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dean Nasser. Good afternoon. Let me begin uh, by saying thank you for that uh, generous introduction and for inviting me here. It's uh, truly a pleasure and honor to, to, to be here. Um, you know, the Arab Spring uh, uh, in of itself is a, a, a very important historical event, uh, uh, one of the most important historical transformations of the latter part of the 20th century. But in the context uh, of uh, your region uh, and this discussion of pivot to Asia, it was also seen uh, for a period as a, as a very welcome development because it justified and many thought would accelerate the process of pivoting and that uh, somehow the Middle East would become airborne and would take flight after the Arab Spring and, and therefore would no longer require uh, a very close monitoring and engagement by the United States. Now, we know that uh, um, two years down the road that uh, it no longer really is a spring. Uh, by, by most definitions, we're already in the winter. Uh, and uh, that it also is becoming a source of uh, growing headaches and uh, a, a, a impetus for a pivot back uh, uh, to the Middle East by the United States. So, and going forward, at least in the next year or two, the Middle East will be far more important in the making of U.S. foreign policy and how it deploys its resources going forward than any strategic statement that the administration has made and is making. I mean, we're, we're at a phase where the, the reality of the Middle East is systematically undermining uh, the, the vision of the administration. And I think the real challenge going forward of the new foreign policy team is actually to st stand back and recalibrate their, their uh, foreign policy position in light of the reality. Uh, now, there, there's a lot of discussion about why did this happen at all, uh, in academia as well as in policy-making circles. It is important largely because uh, the Arab Spring in some ways is not finished. There are other countries that could be potentially target, and we yet to have to understand what the main dynamic here has been and therefore where the region would go. Uh, the immediate uh, knee-jerk reaction to the Arab Spring was to say, well, of course it had to happen. Uh, these are authoritarian regimes. Authoritarianism does not survive. It's unpopular. In the Middle East, it has become particularly uh, personalistic with rulers appointing their children as uh, their heirs, uh, it's become dynastic. Well, of course it was supposed to happen. And then there were also uh, uh, statistics that economists were banding about for a while that have been a source of concern, and they still are. And uh, the most important of these involved the size of the youth population in the Middle East. Uh, w w in country after country in the Arab world, about 60 to 65 percent of the population are 25 and younger. And that has uh, uh, social implications, largely because you have a lot of young people. And we know that uh, whenever you have a cluster of young people, it always causes political instability. There is not a single civil war, revolution, or democracy movement of our time that is not associated with the youth bulge. And especially in the Arab world, there are additional pr pressures, uh, the cultural pressures, the lack of intermingling between the sexes, Etc. creates a much bigger uh, set of uh, problems. And uh, the, the youth bulge was, it was it, people anticipated that it would explode. And uh, the assumption was that the Arab Spring was really about that explosion to, to a great extent. You now have a generation in the Arab world, or let's say the majority of Arabs don't remember the Suez crisis, don't know Gamal Abdel Nasser, don't know the glory days of these dictatorships. And they are much more interested in engagement with the uh, 
global economy, uh, with, with what it means to be part of a global culture, for instance. And this is important because, for instance, in a country where the dog has embarked yet, like Saudi Arabia, the argument is that the single biggest threat to the regime is unemployed, idle youth with iPads and, and, and online. And, uh, uh, and who you know don't have a notion of the country's history, uh, but rather where it is now, and that's not uh, n uh, terribly glorious. The, the youth bulge is connected with another very important factor in the region, and that is that the Middle East has, for s the past three decades, been lagging behind the glo uh, other countries of its size or regions of its type in in, glo in economic terms. It has been growing slower than it was in, in real terms than it was in the 1970s, and it has been largely outside of globalization. So, you know, selling oil and buying tanks is not globalization. And, uh, you know, you can't go to Kmart and find anything that says made in, made in an Arab world generally. And if you, in the early 2000s, uh, put oil aside, the combined exports of all Arab countries was less than Finland. So you know this, and, and we know that growth and economic prosperity and cultural freedoms and openings, these things come with globalization. And there has been a trajectory, there's a point at which Brazil, Indonesia, and Egypt were relatively the same size GDP, same kind of problems, same kind of regimes. And then there's been a very clear parting of the ways from the 1990s. And uh, the assumption was that authoritarianism, corruption, combined with the youth bulge, and lackluster economic development basically created a combustible mix that erupted in 2011. That's true, but we, that doesn't explain why it happened in 2011. Why not 2010 or 2012? And there, you know, you have an interesting set of other factors that matter uh, uh, in the region. W one argument is that it was because of technology. It was really uh, uh, internet and particularly social networking technology that made the Arab Spring possible. These technologies had a contribution, but the real disruptive critical technology were, were, was smartphones, which between uh, 2009 when the Green Movement happened in Iran and 2011, there was a telecommunications revolution in the Middle East. The upgrading of telecommunications so that phones can actually carry data video, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and also that uh, uh, you would have um, uh, uh, devices that could uh, do so. So the introduction of smartphones was the critical factor. Facebook or Twitter benefited from that, but they weren't, uh, they, they would have been irrelevant if the vehicle uh, to uh, make that happen wasn't there. So yes, Facebook and Twitter were there, uh, during the uh, 2009 uprising in Iran, the assumption in the West was that Twitter made the, uh, the Iranian uprising, and Iranians were more, doing more tweeting than Americans were, and in many ways, the Green Movement really made Twitter a company in America at that point in time. But uh, the reality was that Iranian phones didn't carry uh, data. People could tweet at night, but they couldn't be running and tweeting in the, in the streets. It didn't work the way that it was described by, by the media. The other very important technology is actually the older one, which was satellite te uh, television technology. Al Jazeera was singularly instrumental in the Arab Spring. So social networking is important in organizing within one country, but that's true of Facebook everywhere. Uh, the people don't communicate across countries or across cultures on Facebook. Uh, Facebook is a nation of a billion, but it's a highly fragmented nation. Whereas. Al Jazeera was watched and is watched by over 200 million people in 22 countries. And, and that really had uh, the effect of allowing the Arab Spring to travel from country to country. But perhaps one of the most interesting things uh, about the Arab Spring is that we know all about the, the, the bad economic data, the misery, the poverty in the region. And, and it's very easy for us to conclude that, well, of course, poverty and brutality causes an uprising. I would call it a sort of a Le Miserable theory of uh, the Arab Spring. But, it, but that's not the way it happened in reality. Arab Spring did not happen in the poorest country. It happened in a very un-Arab country. It started in Tunisia. Now, Tunisia, for a long time, was known as the China of the Middle East. 
It was growing at the rate of 7 to 9% throughout the 1990s and the 2000s. Yes, it was authoritarian. Yes, there was corruption, but there was a very robust private sector that was doing business with Europe. The Tunisians actually, unlike the rest of the Arabs, do make things that Europeans buy. Uh, they're very tied, or were at least tied to the tourism business in Europe. And even Airbus manufacturing built part of its fuselage in Tunisia. Tunisia was more like Thailand or Costa Rica than it was like Egypt when the Arab Spring happened. And uh, the, uh, the, it is known that about 20% of all Tunisians were on Facebook which, uh, when the uh, Arab Spring happened, which is multiples of the uh, portion of the population that were on Facebook in the United States at, the, at that time. But we know that this started when uh, a, uh, a young um, uh, um, uh, fruit seller set himself on fire. But that would have been a tree falling in the forest, was it not for the rich, well-to-do, educated, upper-middle-class Tunisian kids. So this was a revolution of the haves, not the revolution of the have-nots. It was they that used social networking to organize. It's they who came out in large numbers uh, initially and, and made this into a revolution. Uh, and uh, so in many ways, actually, the, the, and, and that there, are, there are lessons or parallels or similes one can draw between you know, uh, tra uh, transitions beyond wealthy, uh, export-oriented uh, authoritarian regimes of East Asia and Tunisia. Uh, and, and that Tunisia, because it was part of globalization and, and was generating actually growth, it uh, uh, proved to be, uh, it created a middle class that became the, the main engine for, for uh, democracy. And even the country next door, in uh, uh, Egypt, uh, most of the Mubarak's 30 plus years were sort of a public sector dominated socialist economy. Then the last five years, he actually began to reform. The last five years of Mubarak's regime was a lot like Suharto's Indonesia. So it was cronyism, it was you know, corrupt privatization, but it was real. And there was an opening of the market, there was a withdrawal of subsidies to the poor, segment of the population, and there was a growth of the middle class. Again, much like uh, Tunisia, it was not the poor in Egypt that revolted. It was the uh, uh, products of Mubarak's opening that revolted. So the face of the Egyptian revolution was a young, well-educated, westernized uh, uh, executive at Google, Wael Ghani. It was not some woolly-brained you know, uh, um, uh, a charismatic leader coming out of the slums of Cairo. Uh, and, and this is counterintuitive about the region, uh, uh, that, that the force for change came from uh, 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 that sort of a place. Now, why did Tunisia revolt? Tunisia revolted because of the European financial crisis, because the Tunisia was so tied in with Europe that it very immediately imported the bug uh, from Europe into its economy. So the minute the Europeans stopped buying and stopped going on vacation, uh, the, the, uh, the, Tunisians, uh, 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 the Tunisian economy began to tank. Now that's, a, if you want to call it, that's the opposite side of you know, globalization. Uh, there are benefits to being isolated. When, when the U uh, European financial crisis happened, most of the Arab money began going from Dubai to Beirut because Lebanese bank had no subprime mortgage exposure. They were just not participating in that. So uh, uh, there was a linkage between uh, uh, the most globalized part of the Arab world essentially reacting to, to what happened in, in Europe. It's, it's very similar to what the Asian financial crisis did to the Suharto regime. It was a sudden economic shock imported from the outside. The other important exogenous factor, which is still a huge source of concern, was food security. Uh, in uh, uh, the year before the uprisings in Egypt, the price of wheat uh, uh, spiked largely because of uh, climate change issues and which affected the supply and the production. And in a decade before the Syrian uprising, that country went through, has gone through the most um, uh, uh, severe drought, uh, some say since biblical times. And there is shortage of water. There is uh, 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 all kinds of issues related to climate. And if there is one you know, important trigger that explains why 2011 
Well, one is obviously the European financial crisis. The other one is the issues of food security and environment. And, I, I, and Arab Spring is actually interesting is that one place where these sort of big issue of climate, which is we talk a lot about it, but we often don't understand its immediate political implications, really met social political issues in a very real, uh, real way. And you know, next year, next two years, the expectation of the markets is that the price of wheat is going to go even higher. That is probably the best barometer of measuring how well Egypt will do, more than anything else uh, uh, that Morsi does or doesn't uh, do. Now, when the Arab Spring happened, uh, you know there was there was real gain because for the first time the Arab world actually produced a public. It didn't have a public space. Its public space had emptied out. You know, there, there's a sense of entitlement to politics, a demand for transparency, representation, participation among the population, and those have been very good things. But, you know, there, there were certain positive values that were adopted uh, when the Arab Spring happened. They haven't been properly encapsulated in a very positive direction. That partly has to do with the fact that the Arab Spring is unique in that it's a leaderless revolution. There is no Vaclav Havel, there's no Mandela, there's no Khomeini or Nasser here. This was genuinely a grassroots movement. The advantage of it is that you can't crush it. So the president of Egypt cannot crush it. Uh, and largely he cannot crush it because he wasn't the leader of it. He has no authority over the population because he didn't bring down Mubarak. He's the beneficiary of a process uh, in which he participated. Uh, and in Syria, the Assad regime could not crush the opposition because you can't crush an opposition that is more than 100 armed groups and nobody, including those who are trying to help them, know who they are, where they are, and, and what their linkages are. So you cannot decapitate a headless movement. The downside of it is that it doesn't have a leader. There's no leader to engage with. There's nobody to engage with on Syria. There's nobody to engage with in Egypt. There's nobody you can turn to in the Arab world and say, well, who's the boss? Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to persuade? Who's, who's, willing, who's gonna stand up there and give this thing direction? It doesn't exist. Uh, and and uh, then that's connected to a to a to a um, corollary movement, which is the expectation was that the liberals will win the Arab Spring. That this is a liberal phenomenon, and it was at the beginning. The the, the forces in 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 Tunisia and Egypt that inspired this were by and large the upper middle class, more secular liberal forces. But they didn't win the Arab Spring. Uh, in, it's looking a lot like Iran 1979. There may be some people who are, remember covering it that everybody was gaga about Iranian Democrats who lasted just about six months uh, and nobody remembers them anymore uh, where they were. But they were the face of the anti-Shah movement and, and inspired so much hope in the, um, uh, in, in, in the West about what would follow uh, the monarchy in Iran. The reality is, as in Iran, in the Arab world, the liberal forces have no organization. They don't have a ground game, as they call it in America. They don't have ability to organize the population. They have no social contract with the population, with a large amount of the population. They haven't been among them. They haven't given them social services. They haven't been there through earthquakes, droughts, etc. They haven't built a sewage system. They are associated with the West, and they are associated with the, uh, with the regimes that are being overthrown. Uh, and they haven't had time to create networks and relationships. These regimes fell too quickly for the liberal forces to be able to expand their wings. Whereas Islamist forces, like them or not, moderate or radical, have been there in these neighborhoods among the people providing daycare, healthcare, sewage, welfare, finance. Uh, they, 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 have organ they have organization that goes into every village, every neighborhood. They, they are able to run an efficient election campaign. And uh, those things began to show uh, increasingly. And so uh, uh, the, the, the prospect of democracy has brought to fore forces that the West did not anticipate. So the initial reaction was, let's hope for the best. Let's they all will be like the Turks. And, uh, and now, you know, particularly after what happened in Benghazi, there's a, 
in the sense of alarm that uh, you know actually this may not turn out looking like Turkey it may look, begin to look a lot more like Pakistan or Iran and that this sort of Muslim Brotherhood sweep across the Middle East is a now an unstoppable force that um, uh, you know nobody knows what it where will it go what will it do and nobody and it doesn't have a leader either that you could basically say there's a single leader behind it and and that's a, that's a major challenge again you know for 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 the United States to assume that somehow it could just pack up and leave from the Middle East uh, in that kind of a circumstance where the political leadership of the region is, is completely uh, um, uh, unknown and not to add to the fact uh, you can add to the fact that also Al-Qaeda is making a very robust uh, grand entrance in uh, Libya and, and uh, uh, Syria and uh, it, it actually it, um, begs the question if you would as to whether or not this is possible. The third big problem is what we're seeing in Syria. Uh, we should have seen this coming, but nobody did. Uh, and, and there was a sense of denial about Syria. And, and partly this has to do, when, when you look at the Arab states uh, on the western part of the Arab world, they're fairly homogenous. They're not real major divisions of sect or ethnicity. They, by and large, Germany. And when you look, go to the eastern part of the Arab world, they're by and large all Yugoslavians. And uh, you know the, the authoritarian regime is not suppressing individuals, but is protect, has been protecting a particular imbalance of relations between minorities and majorities. And so the very first order of business to be settled is to is to reverse reverse that trend. Now we should have known it because we encountered it in Iraq when the U.S. troops went in Iraq. They assumed that the, the first debate the Iraqis would have is about how to write a constitution and, uh, and how to uh, um, uh, build democracy. But in reality, the main fight was over uh, uh, whether Sunnis were willing to give up power or whether Shiites were willing to share power. The Shiites wanted it. The Sunnis didn't want to give it up. It's the same thing happening in Syria. And I don't think it makes one bit of difference whether Assad goes or stays. It's, the fight is much bigger uh, than Assad. And now the final problem, very briefly, is that the Arab Spring had to do with economics. It still has to do with economics. And the Arabs have had the general misfortune of going democratic when the world is broke. There has been a, a singular lack of economic interest in the Arab world. And we don't have a, any successful democratization wave in our time. Southeast Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, where it has not involved IMF, economic structuring early on, and, and a leadership by the United States and Europe in pushing for economic reform. So I just give you one statistic, which is between uh, uh, 1989 and 1999, the international community, that is the banks, IMF and World Bank, the United States and Europe, put $100 billion in uh, dollars of 1989 to 1999 into Eastern Europe. The total sum of commitment to the Arab Spring is zero. It's absolute zero. And there is zero engagement by the IMF, and zero engagement by the international community. And that, I think, will be the most important reason why this will fail. Because uh, the, the economic transformation that the region needs, the growth that it needs to anchor democracy uh, is not there. Why don't I stop here? I'd be very happy to answer questions and hear from you. Please have a seat. Or, well, thank you. Thank you very much. You've uh, addressed a lot of subjects. Why don't I throw open the, uh, the floor now and see if we have any immediate questions. And uh, back there on the veranda, please. Uh, back there in the middle, please. Uh, Thanks, Professor. A quick question on Egypt. Your expectations for the political landscape going forward, what do you expect to happen? And on the economic side, you mentioned economic structuring. Obviously, there have been negotiations going on between the government and IMF on loans and on government reforms as well. Your expectations for the same? Well, uh, the, the, the political discussion in Egypt is going to be continuing. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, 
uh, the, the, the political discussion is going to be continuing. That's obviously a challenge. There's not a clear way forward on a lot of the political issues. I, I think you know the, the, there's every possibility for the president to be able to consolidate gradual power in the presidency. But the, on the economic side, the discussions with the IMF are ne neither here nor there, and Egypt does not want to do this. A, there is no pressure internally, regionally, or internationally on it in order to actually do economic reforms. Secondly, the money that's on the table by the IMF is less than, I think, 1% of, 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 of Egypt's GDP. It's an it's a extremely small number. There is not a big package on the table. Uh, for Egypt. So it's all pain with very little support, and there is no commitment by Europe or the United States beyond what the IMF is putting down, which would tell them that if you did the IMF package, there is this additional package of trade, you know, uh, access to European markets, and additional subsidy, or, I mean, subsidizing the, uh, through additional money that would, that would go to uh, Egypt. Now, that partly has two implications. One is, 48% of Egyptians in 2011 lived on $2 a day or less. Egypt, in order to get out of a cycle of poverty, needs to grow at 10 to 11% for over a decade. Uh, and you, the grow, you don't, there is no place right now this growth will come from within the current Egyptian economy. So you know the president can keep consolidating power, but he will be facing a situation that, in which the pie is going to shrink. The second is the military. Uh, the, about 80% of all Egyptian industry is owned by the Egyptian military. And they account for about 35% of the country's GDP. If, uh, I don't, I mean, whatever else goes right in Egypt, unless that statistic changes, you're not going to have democracy. And that's not going to change unless there is privatization of the military's economic holdings. And that will not happen unless there is a much more rigorous international pressure to force the, the public sector in Egypt to be whittled down. Okay. And also in, on the same table, please. Over there, please. Thank you so much. I have a question. Would you mind commenting on Yemen and Bahrain, mm -hmm. where in some way or the other America or West is involved? Well, uh, Yemen and uh, Yemen be ended up being a very peculiar case where there was a negotiate exit for uh, the president, but not a uh, actual change in the in the regime. Uh, the, the the United States was very worried about Al Qaeda in Yemen, and that if you ended up with a situation of breakdown of government and breakdown of uh, um, the security apparatus. Uh, Al Qaeda, which was sort of surrounded in parts of Yemen, would basically be able to come from down from the mountain and spread out. So, the, and, and with Saudi Arabia's consensus and intermediation, you ended up to, uh, with a negotiation that got the president out, but the regime stayed, and then the demonstrations dissipated. In Bahrain, you had a you, you had an actual exercise of force by the government and by Saudi Arabia. But Yemen, uh, but, but Bahrain, much like Syria, also has a sectarian division. It was because it things turned sectarian, it was possible to uh, you know, rally about 30% of the population to one side in order to be able to contain an uprising that was basically rooted in the other 60%, 65% on the other side. But uh, as far as the U.S. policy is concerned, the U.S. clearly was not supportive of the protests the way it was supportive of them in, in Egypt, Libya, and Syria. But uh, as far as the Arab Spring is concerned, I don't think we've seen the end of that in, in the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf. I, I think there are excuse me, vulnerabilities there. And, uh, and uh, Potentially, you might have a revival of it, and that's exactly why this debate about what caused the Arab Spring is significant, because those causes may, may resurface again. Okay. Why don't I take one up at the front here to look around the audience? Please. Um, what is the, the implication? What's China's situation now? I mean, the Arab Spring. In, in what sense? In terms of, because like the latest, um, C is going to be in power in March, and um, every spring it happened two years ago, and lately there has been quite a bit of um, 
unrest or civil unrest and uprisings in different cities in China. Um, I was kind of wondering, do you have any viewpoint on that particular view? Area? Well, you know, uh, um, I think at the highest level you could say that some of the things we saw in the Arab Spring, you could say that they can cause protests. So if you have a sudden e economic downturn, you know, even the Iranian Revolution of 1979 happened when you had three, four years of about 10% growth, and then suddenly the price of oil went down, and growth went to five, six percent, and even though that's pretty good, that caused uh, the revolution. Uh, or the, the case of Tunisia, where you have nine percent growth for a decade, and then you have a sudden dip. You can, if, if it's not managed well, or if it's not cushioned well, you may end up uh, with a political situation. The issues that have to do with the environment, I think, going forward, are going to become the most unpredictable and yet sometimes decisive uh, influences on politics. So water shortage, severe weather, uh, um, flooding, lack of food, food security. I mean, these are all sort of unknowns. We cannot plan for it. Uh, we somehow, in a, in a period where these things may happen uh, uh, at will. And they may also cause certain social dislocations that may manifest themselves. But beyond that, I think it's very difficult to predict where political uprising will happen and when it happens, where it will succeed. It didn't succeed in Iran in 2009. And it was actually died down much more quickly than people on the outside would like to believe. And the regime stabilized much more quickly than people thought. So Iran ended up being, being more like Tiananmen Square than Arab Spring. And, and uh, just, if, just because there is dissent or possibility of dissent doesn't mean that it will happen. There are some fundamental differences between these Arab states and China. One is the structure of the regimes. Those regimes were, were extremely personalized. There was no rotation of even the top. Uh, we can see in Iran the fact that Iran's president changes every few years takes some of the pressure out of the system. Because it, gives a sense of at least change. It's not a, a, you know, a single family owning the country. Uh, and then you know, the economics uh, uh, of the Middle East, by and large, is quite different. Um, uh, and uh, it's into, uh, it's, China is in a very different, uh, different place. Uh, so I, I wouldn't want to draw too close a parallel, other than to say that uh, you know, issues of sudden change in growth rates or, or uh, uh, changes in um, that might be brought by climate, etc., can play, play a decisive role that people may not be anticipating. Okay, why don't we get another one out in the corner uh, of the veranda back there, please? Oops, sorry. And then we'll get one back in this corner. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in your uh, further thoughts on Al Jazeera. Um, I work for Al Jazeera for the English Channel from Doha, from the end of 2010 to mid 2012. So, to what extent do you think, um, in your opinion, um, Al Jazeera played a domino effect in the Arab Spring? I think it played a it played an ex extremely important role uh, at two levels. One was that Al Jazeera basically provided all the footage that the, that the world saw at the beginning. So that that was good for Al Jazeera's own image in the West, but. It also galvanized the international community around uh, the uprisings in Egypt and, and Tunisia. And, and it was much easier for, to, to sort of get policymakers in Washington to demand uh, that Mubarak goes immediately because of the footage they were seeing through CNN and Fox News, et cetera, all of which came from Al Jazeera. So the infrastructure and ability to broadcast was very important. Secondly, Al Jazeera is watched. I mean, there is Al Jazeera, and there is also the Al Jazeera model in the Arab world, which means this sort of um, uh, satellite broadcasting that, that is pan-Arabic, if you would, and then with presence in varieties of Arab states. Although Al Jazeera does it best, it has the most number of bureaus, most number of reporters. And there is no two ways that uh, uh, the, the site of Ben Ali falling, or the site of particularly of Mubarak leaving, and people watching this on television, was extremely important. And, and uh, you know, there were a lot of copycats that happened. Like there were the mini Arab Spring in Oman and Qatar, which, you know, uh, there's no reason to expect Qataris have anything to protest about. 
but but you know they were watching Al Jazeera and they thought they go to the local mall with placards and and uh, also demand uh, opening. Uh, uh, but but it broke a taboo. I mean you know the, this idea of that you had this stable authoritarianism that is untouchable, it will never fall, and that a, a population is too cowed to stand up to it. That really Al Jazeera helped break that. So the power of the imagery was extremely important. But it had no organizational effect. Uh, that really went to uh, um, you know, use telephones and texting and then uh, um, uh, Facebook and Twitter and then old, good old fashioned you know, grassroots organization via phone and, and contact. Okay, um, why don't I get two last questions, we'll combine them, uh, maybe you one from George and one from Ernst here. I'd like to ask you about um, Shia versus Sunni issues, which you've written about in the past. How much of that is a live issue, and whether that has been exaggerated um, in the media, um, sort of how that's playing out. You've written a lot about in Iran, in Iraq, um, Shia the revival. It is a real issue. Uh, I mean, you know, the region likes to deny that the, this exists, but it exists. I mean. Uh, just uh, two days ago in Pakistan, there was a bombing that killed over 100 Shiites. It was deliberately targeted at them. And in the past one year, there have been 4,500 Shias, uh, doctors, lawyers, etc., have been assassinated or, or killed in Pakistan uh, uh, through bombings or direct assassinations. It exists. Now, uh, you know, how, uh, uh, how critical it is, is it, is it dominating every single division, no, but right now at this point in time, it is a, an important strategic fault line in the region for the following reason, that there are live, live and ongoing conflicts between Shiites and Sunni over power. These are in Iraq, in Bahrain, in Kuwait, in, uh, in Lebanon, and, and obviously in, in, in Syria. So th these are real fights over who's going to own the state. So it's very clear that Lebanese, Syrians, Iraqis, doesn't matter what they tell you, the journalists, we're all Iraqis, and this didn't exist before the US showed up. But they're definitely not behaving as if they're all Iraqis or Syrians. So you belong to another community, and you claim that your community is going to decide who the Sy who Syrians and Iraqis are, and this is a real fight. And it's really a, an ethnic conflict of sorts. It's not that different from the Balkans or Northern Ireland. And until that's going on, this is going to be an issue. Secondly, you have a revival uh, right now of particularly Sunni, uh, call it fundamentalism, Islamism, and particularly the Salafi side of it, which is, uh, 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 is very uh, uh, focused on who's a right Muslim and who's not. And Salafism clearly is not pluralistic or tolerant in that sense. Uh, and therefore, the issue of uh, you know, uh, whether Sufis, you know, the Islamic mystical orders, as we're seeing in Mali, or, or Shiites would actually be included in their definition of the Arab world or in their definition of Islam is clearly up for grabs. So you know, when you talk to Shiites, the biggest worry is the rise of Salafism. The fact that they're winning large chunks of the vote in Tunisia and Egypt, and they can have a perch in deciding public opinion. Uh, and this is real. I mean, an Arab world that who, whose influence is dominated by Salafis to um, the Shiites would look like uh, an India dominated by BJP from the perspective of Muslims. It's no longer Nehru's India. And then finally, you know, you su superimpose on this the most important strategic rivalry in the e region, which is between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and to some extent, Iran and Turkey. And uh, Iranians also, the Iranian leadership deny that there is such thing as sectarian conflict. And it's all it's done by the CIA, and, and it's all an American-made myth. But, but the reality is that they are a Shia country. They can't d disown that. The, the Sunnis around them, in particularly in the Persian Gulf region, problematize Iran's identity. And resistance to Iran uh, essentially uh, takes a, a, a Persian versus Arab, but also a Shia versus Sunni uh, a coloring to it. And, uh, and, and the Iranian rivalry in the region is real. The Iranians want to you know, exercise power over the Gulf. They want to dominate their region. They have nationalistic ambitions. 
and, uh, and, and, and that sort of plays into that other, other struggle. So I think it's real. I, I, I think it's very difficult for those in the West not to simplify it too much into black and white. And I think it's very difficult to understand the nuances of it, of how it works and when it doesn't work. Um, so you know, we're sort of just learning this dimension of Middle East politics. Quick question, Robert. Um, a follow up, actually, on this. Do you think these nation states in the Middle East, most of them are very young, some of them like serious, less than 100 years, will they survive in their present form? And, and, and if not, uh, will we have some kind of then pan Sunni state? And, and then, or on uh, the other side, pan, pan Shiite state? Or will it be rather like kind of ex Yugoslavia, where we have like kind of different mini states? Uh, well, you know, there's, a, there's an Egyptian thinker who once said there are two nations in the Middle East, Iran and Egypt. Everybody else is tribes with flags. Uh, uh, a lot of the lines were drawn by the British and by the, by the French, and uh, the, uh, there is a lot of uh, potential for breakup. But, you know, countries around the world don't break up largely because the international community doesn't let them break up. And the cases like Yugoslavia, there was, it was facilitated by the international community. So you know, the Pope and his European powers worked to get Slovenia and, and Croatia out of Yugoslavia, so then the rest of it fell apart. But you know, the country after country, we're seeing this in Mali. I mean, the Tuareg uprising in the north is really about separatism. Now it's become radicalized. But the, the, the international community would not let the Tuaregs to separate from Mali. Northern Nigeria should poten would potentially separate from southern Nigeria. But you know, despite a lot of war, that's not happened. So in the Middle East, the potential exists. Um, uh, what keeps it together is that there is also a sense on the ground that people don't want to separate out. So they're fighting over the state. Other than the Kur Kurds, nobody really wants out. So you know, the, the Alawites or the Sunnis both want to control Syria, and the Shiites and Sunnis both claim to want to control Iraq. But the direction that things are going, and, and Syria might very well be the catalyst, may actually create a, a situation in which you will effectively have a coming apart of the current borders. Um, you know, Syria doesn't have a soft landing. So you can either, it can end up either having a prolonged civil war like Lebanon, in which you end up with cantons and, and regions, or as some say that you know the Alawites are just going to go to the mountain, take their chemical weapons with them, as the Maronites did in Lebanon to Beirut and the north, and basically you will have a de facto green line, and potentially it could become a, a separate separate state. In Iraq now, the situation is almost set for Iraq to break up. The Kurds now have their own oil deal and pipelines with Turkey. The Sunnis are disenchanted with, with, with the middle. If Syria uh, ends up producing uh, the right kind of a catalyst, you may end up with, uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, Iraq breaking up. I don't think you're going to see a pan-Sunni entity in the Middle East. That's more aspiration than possibility. But Sunnis and Shiites or uh, various states and actors will, will, as is the case in everywhere international relations, as is the case in Congo, will always find a client and try to advance their interests. And, uh, and, and the sympathies would go to obviously co-religionists or, or your co-sect. But the likelihood of Syrians and, 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 um, and Egyptians becoming one is as remote as when Nasser and the Ba'athists tried it in 1958 to 62. Um, but you know the, the 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 Middle East is uh, uh, is at a sort of an edge where it can actually become the cauldron of a lot bigger set of conflicts because there is a lot of unresolved uh, ethnic and sectarian issues that now the Arab Spring is bringing to the fore, and the international community has been extremely slow in trying to get ahead of this. It's just playing catch up only on a need to intervene basis. Thank you very much, Dean Nasser. We appreciate your coming. Um, we'd like to give all of our guests something to remember. Thank you for inviting me.